Lehi in the Desert, Chapter 3, Into the Desert, Lehi the Dreamer. Lehi possesses in a high degree the traits and characteristics of the model sheikh of the desert. He is generous, noble, impulsive, fervent, devout, and visionary, and he possesses a wonderful capacity for eloquence and dreams. As to the dreams, when the Arabs wander, they feel they must be guided by dreams, and their sheikhs are often gifted dreamers. The substance of Lehi's dreams is highly significant, since men's dreams necessarily represent, even when inspired, the things they see by day, albeit in strange and wonderful combinations. It is common for men in every age, for example, to dream of ships, but a man in Lehi's day must dream of particular kinds of ships, and no others will do. In his dreams, Lehi finds himself wandering in a dark and dreary waste, a dark and dreary wilderness, where he must travel for the space of many hours in darkness, lost and helpless. Of all the images that haunt the early Arab poets, this is by all odds the commonest. It is the standard nightmare of the Arab, and it is the supreme boast of every poet that he has traveled long distances through dark and dreary wastes all alone. Invariably, darkness is given as the main source of terror. The heat and glare of the day, though nearly always mentioned, are given second place. And the culminating horror is almost always a mist of darkness, a depressing mixture of dust and clammy fog, which, added to the night, completes the confusion of any who wander in the waste. Quite contrary to what one would expect, these dank mists are described by travelers in all parts of Arabia, and al ajaj one of the greatest of early desert poets, tells how a mist of darkness makes it impossible for him to continue a journey to Damascus. In its nature and effect, Lehi's mist of darkness conforms to this strange phenomenon almost exactly. When Lehi dreams of the vanity of the world, he sees a large and spacious building, suspended in the air, out of reach, and full of smart and finely dressed people. That is exactly how the Bedouin of the desert, to whom the great stone houses of the city are an abomination, pictured the wicked world. And, as the city Arabs still mock their desert cousins, whom they secretly envy, with every show of open contempt, so the well-dressed people in the big house were in the attitude of mocking and pointing their fingers at the poor little band of bedraggled wanderers hungrily eating fruit from a tree, and duly abashed that their poverty should be put to open shame. One is reminded by Lehi's story of the great stone houses of the ancient Arabs, ten- and twelve-story skyscrapers that represent genuine survivals of ancient Babylonian architecture, with their windows beginning, for the sake of defense, fifty feet from the ground. At night, these lighted windows would certainly give the effect of being suspended above the earth. It is interesting that Joseph Smith, Sr. had almost the same dream, according to his wife, who took comfort in comparing the wanderings of her own family with those of Father Lehi. But what is significant is not the resemblance of the two dreams, but the totally different settings of the two. When the prophet's father dreamed himself lost in this field of the world, he could see nothing save dead, fallen timber, a picture which, of course, faithfully recalls his own frontier background. When Dante, another Westerner, sees himself lost in the midst of life's journey, one of the commonest and oldest of dreams, we repeat, a very classic among dreams, he is wandering through a dense, dark forest, the forest of his native Tuscany. In a pleasanter vein, Lehi sees a large and spacious field, as if it had been a world, just as the Arab poet describes the world as a maidan, or large and spacious field. When he dreams of a river, it is a true desert river, a clear stream a few yards wide with its source but a hundred paces away, or else a raging muddy wash, a sail of filthy water that sweeps people away to their destruction. In the year 960 A.D., according to Bar Habreus, a large band of pilgrims returning from Mecca encamped in the bed of a brook in which water had not flowed for a long time, and during the night, whilst they were sleeping, a flood of water poured down upon them all, and it swept them and all their possessions out into the great sea, and they all perished. Even a mounted rider, if he is careless, may be caught off guard and carried away by such a sudden spate of headwater, according to Doughty. One of the worst places for these gully-washing torrents of liquid mud is in the scarred and bare mountains which run parallel to the west coast of Arabia. The rainstorms break against this long ridge and produce almost in a moment raging torrents, the Arabic sail, spate, 
which sweep away all obstacles without warning and with loss of life of man and cattle. This was the very region through which Lehi traveled on his great trek. The springhead and the sail, such are the two and only types of river, for he calls them rivers, known to the desert Arab. When Lehi dreams of people gone astray, they are lost in a trackless waste, wandering in strange roads, or blundering into broad roads that they perish and are lost because of the mist of darkness. Losing one's way is, of course, the fate that haunts every desert dweller sleeping and waking, and the Arab poets are full of the terror of strange roads and broad ways. To symbolize what is utterly inaccessible, Lehi has shown a great and terrible gulf, an awful gulf, a tremendous chasm with one's objective, the tree of life, maddeningly visible on the other side. All who have traveled in the desert know the feeling of utter helplessness and frustration at finding one's way suddenly cut off by one of those appalling canyons with perpendicular sides. Nothing could be more abrupt, more absolute, more baffling to one's plans, and so will it be with the wicked in a day of reckoning. Wherever else one might find parallels to these things, in combination they could only come from a man who knew the desert. Ruba, one of the desert poets, describes in a single short poem the terror of the loneliness, the long journey, the mist of darkness, sultry and thick, the awful gulf, the broad ways, and the paths that stray. The Book of Mormon, in giving us not a few such clear and vivid snapshots, there are many more to come, of life in another world, furnishes picturesque but convincing proof of its own authenticity. Nephi's complaint, they sought to take away my life, that they might leave me in the wilderness to be devoured by wild beasts, is ever in the mouth of the Arab poet. For to leave one's enemy lying in the desert to be devoured by wild beasts is standard and correct procedure when Arabs quarrel, and for all its popularity with the poets, no mere figure of speech. Let's take a look at Lehi's flight into the wilderness. That a wealthy citizen of Jerusalem should leave the land of his inheritance at a moment's notice, and with no more substantial incitement than a dream, may seem at first blush highly improbable, to say the least. Yet Lehi had brooded long and anxiously over the fate of Jerusalem, praying with all his heart in behalf of his people, and when the dream came, he was prepared. Moreover, in taking his sudden departure, Lehi was doing not only the sensible, but also the ordinary thing. From the earliest times to the present day, the correct thing to do when going got rough in the cities and states of the Near East was simply to take off and seek the security of the desert. Sinuhi, a high official in the court of Amenemhet I, fearing a palace revolution on the death of the king, rushed impulsively out into the night and the desert, where he would have perished of thirst had he not been picked up by some friendly Arabs who traded with Egypt. His story, thirteen hundred years older than Lehi's, illustrates the ease with which men passed between the desert and the town, and shows us how natural was the impulse to take to the sands in a crisis. Had not Moses and the prophets, and even Father Abraham himself, sought safety from their enemies by flight into the desert? Had not the whole nation of Israel done the same in the beginning? But what makes Lehi's story ring true with perfect pitch is the recent discovery that those very leaders of the Jews at Jerusalem whose wickedness had obliged Lehi to leave the land while there was yet time, when they found the city on the verge of destruction and themselves faced with the consequences of their own folly, hid in the wilds during the siege, and when all was lost, fled to Egypt. Hiding in the wilds was exactly what Lehi, and later anyone else who could escape, was doing. The desert to which Sanuhi fled was the country south of Palestine, the classic hideout land both of the Egyptians and the Jews, where men of all conditions and nations took to the Arab camp as a safe retreat and refuge. While the Syrian desert is the unenvied resort of defeated tribes, the proper home of the outcast, escapist, and discredited revolutionary was ever Edom and the South Country, the land of disoriented groups and of individual fugitives where organized semi nomad tribes alternate with the flotsam and jetsam of sedentary society, with runaway slaves, bandits, and their descendants. Even the great merchants who brought forth the civilized Nabataean state placed their confidence, says Diodorus, in the ability to disappear quickly and easily into the desert, like any common Bedouin. So let us not suppose that Lehi was the first big merchant to take to the back country with his worried family. 
Even in the present century, Arab farmers and town dwellers, to flee the exactions of a tyrannical Turkish government, fled to the desert and adopted the life of wandering Bedouins, and in recent years thousands of fellahin, raised to a life of farming, might have been seen eking out a miserable existence on the sands of the Syrian desert as the result of hasty and ill-advised flight from their home. We have mentioned that the Jews who were at Jerusalem, who finally got away when the city fell, ended up in Egypt. Many of them settled far up the Nile at Elephantine or Yeb. This famous colony has been described as but an eccentric deviation from the broad pathway of Hebrew history. It led nowhere, and had no influence on the development even of Egyptian Judaism. In such words we might describe Lehi's own migration, an eccentric deviation breaking off completely from the main current of Jewish history, but, like the Elephantine settlement, preserving its own peculiar vision of transplanted Judaism intact. The Elephantine story, by demonstrating the possibility of a development that scholars at first found inconceivable and were long reluctant to believe, confirms the possibility of just such an expedition as Lehi's. The Jews throughout history display, as Montgomery observes, a constant tendency to revert to type and go back to the desert, and Lehi was by no means the first or last Jew to do so. Furthermore, it is not uncommon for rich town and country people, and even poor farmers, to take to the desert for a spell and enjoy from time to time a taste of nomad life, so that Lehi's behavior in turning Bedouin was thoroughly conventional and respectable. Of course, those who take that sort of vacation are those who already have a good deal of experience in the desert way and have acquired a liking for it. As to the direction taken by Lehi's party, the Book of Mormon is clear and specific. He took what we now know to have been the only possible way out, what with immediate danger threatening from the north and the eastern and western lands held by opposing powers on the verge of war, only the south desert, the one land where Israel's traders and merchants had felt at home through the centuries, remained open. Even after Jerusalem fell, this was so, and the one route into that desert was the great trade road down the burning trough of the Arabah. For a long time the party traveled south-southeast, and then struck out almost due east over a particularly terrible desert and reached the sea at a point to be considered later. Nephi is careful to keep us informed of the main bearing of every stage of the journey, and never once does he mention a westerly or northerly trend. The party traveled for eight years in but two main directions, without retracing their steps or doubling back, and many of their marches were long, forced marches. All this entirely excludes the Sinaitic Peninsula as the scene of their wanderings, and it fits perfectly with the journey through the Arabian Peninsula. The slowest possible march in south-southeasterly direction in Sinai would reach the sea and have to turn north within ten days. Yet Lehi's people traveled for many days, nay months, in a south-southeasterly direction, keeping near the coast of the Red Sea all the time. Ten days take a foot traveler the entire length of that coast of Sinai which runs in a south-southeasterly direction, and what of the rest of the eight years? What entirely excludes Sinai as the field of Lehi's journeying is the total lack at all times of timber to build ships with, to say nothing of a lush and beautiful land bountiful. Even if Lehi took the main southern route down the Arabah, as he very probably did, since it was the direct road to the Red Sea, and a caravan way known to all the merchants, he would be moving through a desert so repelling that even the hardened Bedouins avoid it like the plague. Nor need we look there for any monuments of his passing. The Egyptians, the patriarchs, the Jews, the Romans, the Crusaders, and the Arabs all passed over these tracks, and they have given us place names and no more. Probably in their eyes the country was too detestable to merit further reference. Detestable certainly describes the place in the eyes of Lehi's people, who murmured bitterly at being led into such a hell. So in the midst of the desert, Lehi's family became tent people. The editors of the Book of Mormon have given a whole verse to Nephi's laconic statement, And my father dwelt in a tent and rightly so, since Nephi himself finds the fact very significant and refers constantly to his father's tent as the center of his universe. To an Arab, my father dwelt in a tent, says everything. The present inhabitants of Palestine, writes Canaan, like their forefathers, are of two classes, dwellers in villages and cities, and the Bedouin. 
as the life and habits of the one class differ from those of the other, so do their houses differ. Houses in villages are built of durable material. On the other hand, Bedouin dwellings, tents, are more fitted for nomadic life. An ancient Arab poet boasts that his people are the proud, the chivalrous people of the horse and camel, the dwellers in tents, and no miserable ox-drivers. A Persian king, but fifty years after the fall of Jerusalem, boasts that all the civilized kings, as well as the Bedouin tent-dwellers, brought their costly gifts and kissed my feet, thus making the same distinction as the later poet. One of the commonest oaths of the Arabs, Burkhard reports, is by the life of this tent and its owners, taken with one hand resting on the middle tent pole. If a man's estate is to be declared void after his death, the tent posts are torn up immediately after the man has expired, and the tent is demolished. While on the other hand, the erection of a new tent in the desert is an important event celebrated with feast and sacrifice and the cult of the tent was as important to the Hebrews as well. Indeed, the Hebrew word for tent, ohel, and the Arabic word for family, ahe, were originally one and the same word. The Bedouin has a strong affection for his tent, says Canaan. He will not exchange it with any stone house. So Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents, though, let us add, by no means in squalor. Casual travelers in the Orient, who have seen only the filthy and wretched tents of the tribeless gypsy Bedouins, would be surprised, perhaps, at the spaciousness and simple luxury in the tent of a great desert sheikh. So with the announcement that his father dwelt in a tent, Nephi serves notice that he had assumed the desert way of life, as perforce he must for his journey. Any Easterner would appreciate the significance and importance of the statement, which to us seems almost trivial. If Nephi seems to think of his father's tent as the hub of everything, he is simply expressing the view of any normal Bedouin, to whom the tent of the sheikh is the sheet anchor of existence. A white flag, we are told, is sometimes hoisted above his tent to guide strangers and visitors. All visitors are led directly to the tent of the sheikh. When Nephi urged the frightened Zoram to join the party in the desert, he said, If thou wilt go down into the wilderness to my father, thou shalt have place with us. The correctness of the proposal is attested not only by the proper role of Lehi in receiving members and guests into the tribe, but also in the highly characteristic expression, Thou shalt have place with us. For since time immemorial, the proper word of welcome to the stranger who enters one's tent has been Alan Wasalan Wamahaban, literally, perhaps, a family, a smooth place, and a wide place. Equivalent expressions are found in the Old Testament, as when Abraham invites his heavenly visitor to sit beneath his tree, and here, too, such details are authentic touches of Bedouin life. But none of the Bible expressions are as typically Arabic as Nephi's invitation. The Order of March The Book of Mormon tells us a good deal about how Lehi and his people moved through the desert, and the report can now be checked against the first-hand accounts of life with the Arabs, which the last one hundred years, and especially the last forty, have brought forth. All these would agree with Nephi that the keynote of life in Arabia is hardship. Life is hard, a ceaseless struggle for existence against nature and man. It is no exaggeration, writes a present-day authority, to say that the Bedouin is in an almost permanent state of starvation. Many times between their waterings, Doughty reports, there is not a single pint of water left in the greatest sheikh's tent. Palgrave's recollection is particularly impressive then an insufficient halt for rest or sleep at most of two or three hours, soon interrupted by the oft-repeated admonition, If we linger here we all die of thirst, sounding in our ears, and then to remount our jaded beasts and push them on through the dark night amid the constant probability of attack and plunder from roving marauders, and about an hour before sunset we would stagger off our camels as best we might to prepare an evening feast of precisely the same description as that of the forenoon, or more often, lest the smoke of our fire should give notice to some distant rover to content ourselves with dry dates and half an hour's rest on the sand. This, it is true, is marching under pressure, but the conditions, no fire, raw meat, wading through much affliction, are exactly duplicated in the Book of Mormon. 
Lehi's party is described as moving through the desert for a few days, three or four, one would estimate, and then camping for the space of a time. This is exactly the way the Arabs move. Caravan speeds run between two and one quarter and three and nine-tenths miles an hour, 30 miles being, according to Chessman, a good average for the day, and 60 miles being the absolute maximum. The usual estimate for a good day's march is reckoned by Arab riders at between 28 and 30 miles. In special or favored circumstances, it might be near 40. On the other hand, a day's slow journey for an ass nomad moving much slower than camel riders is 20 miles. The number of days spent camping at any one place varies, as the Book of Mormon, with circumstances. From 10 to 12 days is the average time a Bedouin encampment of ordinary size will remain on the same ground, according to Jennings Bramley, who, however, observes, I have known them to stay in one spot for as long as five or six months. The usual thing is to camp as long as possible in one place until it is soiled by the beasts and the multiplication of fleas becomes intolerable and the surroundings afford no more pasturage. Then the tents are pulled down and the men decamp. On the Syrian and Arabian plains, according to Burkhard, the Bedouins encamp in summer near wells, where they remain often for a whole month. Lehi's time schedule thus seems to be a fairly normal one, and the eight years he took to cross Arabia argue neither very fast nor very slow progress. The Bani Hilal took twenty-seven years to go a not much greater distance. After reaching the seashore, Lehi's people simply camped there for the space of many days until a revelation again put them in motion. Consider the problem of baggage. Were Lehi's party ass nomads or camel nomads? The latter, there can be no doubt. The times required it, and the Book of Mormon all but insists on it. But before turning to the evidence, it would be well to correct the theory, sometimes propounded, that the party went on foot. When the Lord appoints a man to a task, he gives him the means of carrying it out, as Nephi himself observes, and to Lehi he had given ample means indeed. The sight of a rich merchant and his family setting out for the desert in a caravan, even of some magnificence, would never have excited the slightest comment from Lehi's neighbors. Burkhardt describes as a matter of course passing by the caravan of a rich merchant from Muscat in the deep desert. He had ten camels to carry his women, his infant children, his servants, and his baggage. Lehi would have been such a one. But for an elderly and aristocratic Hebrew to load himself, his wife, and his children with tents, utensils, weapons, food, and other supplies would have been as unthinkable then as now. Without the camel, writes a modern authority, it would be impossible for the nomads to carry their tents and furniture over the vast sandy spaces where asses can pass only with difficulty and carry only a very small load. The decisive clue is the fact that Lehi's party took grain with them, and all matter of seeds of every kind. The Arabs, as we shall see, do this when they migrate in earnest, packing the seed in big black 150 to 180 pound sacks, two to a camel. At the very least, there has to be enough grain either to make a worthwhile crop somewhere or to supply substantial food on the way. And who could carry such a load on his back? To pass through the heart of Arabia on the best camel in the world requires almost superhuman endurance, no need to make the thing ridiculous by carrying children, tents, books, food, furniture, weapons, and grain on one's back. Raswan tells us that camel breeders do not fear the waterless stretches of the desert as the sheep and goat raising Arabs do, and for that reason camel owners alone remain independent and free. On the other hand, they are often in danger of starving. And when we read that Lehi's people were continually in such danger and supported themselves by hunting alone so that a broken bow could mean death by starvation, we may be sure that they were camel nomads without flocks, as indeed their hasty flight from Palestine requires. Among the listings of the stuff they took with them, flocks are never mentioned, as of course they would be had they had such. The flocks of every kind of the Jaredites are always given first place in the description of their migration, and we may confidently assume that the silence of Nephi on this head indicates that his people did not travel as herdsmen. But neither does Nephi mention camels. Why not? For the very reason that they received no notice in many an Arabic poem which describes travel in the desert, simply because they are taken for granted. In the East, the common words for travel are camel words, 
Thus rahal and safar, the two basic words, both mean to set out on a journey, and also to saddle a camel. The presence of camels being inferred when no special mention is made of them. When I say I drove from Heber to Salt Lake, no one would think to ask in a car, though for all my hearers know I may have driven a chariot or a tricycle. In the same way, when the Arab reports that he has journeyed in the desert, he never adds, on a camel, for in his language, to travel means to go by camel. Had Lehi's party gone afoot, that would indeed have been a nine days' wonder, and something would have referred to it on every page, for such a thing was never seen nor heard of before or since his day. But when the camel is the only means of travel, it is unnecessary to mention camels in describing a journey as it would be to specify that one sails the seas in a ship. There is one episode, however, in which camels play a definite role in the Book of Mormon. From their base camp in the Valley of Lemuel, Lehi's sons made a flying trip back to Jerusalem. It was the young men alone who made the journey, which turned out, as they expected, to be a dangerous one. Now it is the established procedure among the Arabs for a few young men in a tribe to seek gain and glory by making quick raids on neighboring towns and tribes. On such expeditions they never take tents, for their transportation is limited and speed is of the essence. Nephi wants us to know that this trip to Jerusalem was no such raid, for they were going on legitimate business and took their tents with them. They went boldly and openly into Laban and stated their business. Only when he treated them as robbers were they forced to act as such, slinking about like true Bedouins outside the gates and entering the city only by night. A typical Oriental episode of the story is the wild pursuit out of the city and into the desert. How many a filibuster by Bedouin braves in the town has ended that way? You chase me and I chase you is the essence of desert tactics according to Philby. Of this exciting chase, Nephi reports, We fled into the wilderness, and the servants of Laban did not overtake us, and we hid ourselves in the cavity of a rock. Note that they were pursued right into the wilderness, for upon reaching the desert they were not safe, but had to hide under a rock. The young men might have fled a short distance through the town on foot, but fleeing into the wilderness was another matter. There they would have been quickly run down by mounted riders, unless they first escaped notice. But Nephi tells us that they hid only after they had outrun their pursuers, who failed to overtake them. The powerful and affluent military governor certainly had a fleet of steeds that could run down a camel, but in the sudden getaway of the brothers there would be no time to saddle them. An ancient Arab poet and king, Imrul Qais, speaks of a phenomenal horse that passed the night with saddle and bridle on him without being sent to the stable but other horses, including Laban's, would need more attention and lose more time getting under way, and we can confidently assume that both pursuers and pursued rode the usual camels. As for the chance that Nephi and his brethren were mounted on horses, it is a remote one, for the horse cannot carry burdens in the desert, and even horse-raising Arabs seldom ride their animals on long journeys, but whenever possible lead them tethered to their camels without riders or loads. Raswan gives many illustrations of this. The use of camels is implied at every turn of the story of the mission to Laban. The otherwise insane carrying of tents, the trip down country to bring back exceeding great property to Laban's palace hardly on their shoulders, the flight into the open country and pursuit in the desert, and finally the long and necessarily hasty return trip, for they were marked men and possibly the direction of their takeoff had been noted, to the secret base camp. Just as the saints who had the means of avoiding it never crossed the plains on foot, so we would think Lehi's sons foolish indeed if they did not avail themselves of the common means of transportation that everyone was using, for camels were as common then as automobiles are today. Food, on the other hand, would be a problem. Not many years ago, Professor Frankfurt wrote of the South Desert, The secret of moving through its desolation had at all times been kept by the Bedouin. Intrepid explorers of our own day have learned the secret, however, and Lehi knew of it too. Like a sudden flash of illumination comes the statement that Lehi, by divine instruction, led us in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. Woolley and Lawrence describe such more fertile parts as stretching over the flat floor of the plain in long lines like hedges. They are the depressions of dried-up watercourses, sometimes hundreds of miles long, 
They furnish, according to Bertram Thomas, the arteries of life in the steppe, the path of the Bedouin movement, the habitat of animals by reason of the vegetation, scant though it is, which flourishes in their beds alone. In Arabia it is this practice of following the more fertile parts of the wilderness that alone makes it possible for both men and animals to survive. Chessman designates as touring the practice followed by men and beasts of moving from place to place in the desert as spots of fertility shift with the seasons. The Arab forager is everlastingly prowling, scouting, tracking, and spying. In fact, some believe that the original name of the Arab and Hebrew is a combination of sounds meaning to lie in ambush. Every Bedouin is a sportsman, both from taste and necessity, writes one observer, who explains how in large families some of the young men are detailed to spend all their time hunting. Nephi and his brethren took over the business of full-time hunters, and in that office betrayed the desert tradition of the family, for Nephi had brought a fine steel bow from home with him. Though we shall consider steel again in dealing with the sort of Laban, it should be noted here that a steel bow was not necessarily a solid piece of metal any more than the Canaanites' chariots of iron were solid iron, or that various implements mentioned in the Old Testament as being of iron, examples are carpenter's tools, pens, threshing instruments, were iron and only iron. It was in all probability a steel-ribbed bow, since it broke at about the same time that the wooden bows of his brothers lost their springs. Only composite bows were used in Palestine, that is, bows of more than one piece, and a steel-backed bow would be called a steel bow, just as an iron-trimmed chariot was called a chariot of iron. Incidentally, the founder of the Turkish Seljuk dynasty of Iran was called the Hak, which means in Turkish, says our Arab informant, a bow made out of iron. The fact that iron arrow was a fairly common name among those people and refers actually to an iron-headed arrow is a strong indication that the name steel bow may also refer to a real weapon. Hunting in the mountains of Arabia to this day is carried out on foot and without hawks or dogs. In classical times the hunter in this area was equipped with a bow and a sling exactly like Nephi. Nephi's discovery that the best hunting was only at the top of the mountain agrees with later experience, for the oryx is a shy animal that travels far and fast over the steppe and desert in search of food, but retires ever to the almost inaccessible sand mountains for safety. In western Arabia these mountains are not sand but rock, and Burkhart reports that in these mountains between Medina and the sea, all the way northward, this is bound to include Lehi's area, Mountain goats are met, and the leopards are not uncommon. Julius Eutine has left us vivid descriptions of the danger, excitement, and exhaustion that go with the hunting of the big game that abounds in these mountains, which are, by the way, very steep and rugged. Things looked black when Nephi broke his fine steel bow, for the wooden bows of his brother had lost their springs. Note the peculiarly Semitic use of the plural for a noun of quality. And though skilled in the art of hunting, they knew little enough about bow-making, which is a skill reserved to specialists even among primitives. Incidentally, archery experts say that a good bow will keep its spring for about 100,000 shots, from which one might calculate that the party at the time of the crisis had been traveling anything from one to three years. It was, of course, out of the question to make the familiar composite bow, and it was something of a marvel when Nephi did make out of wood a bow. For the hunter, the most conservative of men, would never dream of changing from a composite to a simple bow. Though it sounds simple enough when we read about it, it was almost as great a feat for Nephi to make a bow as it was for him to build a ship, and he is justly proud of his achievement. According to the ancient Arab writers, the only bow wood obtainable in all Arabia was the Nabah wood that grew only amid the inaccessible and overhanging crabs of Mount Jazem and Mount Ads which are situated in the very region where, if we follow the Book of Mormon, the broken bow incident occurred. How many factors must be correctly conceived and correlated to make the apparently simple story of Nephi's bow ring true? The high mountain near the Red Sea had a considerable journey down the coast, the game on the peaks, hunting with bow and sling, the finding of bow wood viewed as something of a miracle by the party. What are the chances of reproducing such a situation by mere guesswork? As for the grain which Lehi carried, it was not to be eaten on the journey, for it was seed of every kind, a needless concern for variety unless it was meant to be sown. While ordinary travelers scarcely ever carry grain for food in the desert, 
It is a common thing for migrating Bedouins to carry seed with them in the thought, sometimes very vague indeed, that possibly, if the year is a good one, they might find a chance to sow a hasty crop. In Sinai, the Bedouin yearly sow the beds of the wadis, but they do this with little hope of reaping a harvest more than once in every three or four years. Lehi, looking for a promised land, would under no circumstances have set out without such provision for securing crops in his new home. In traveling, the wheat is put into the black homemade goat's hair sacks, fardet. The fardet, the Hebrew sack of Genesis 42:25, holds about 150 to 180 pounds of wheat. Two are put on a camel. The mention of the custom in Genesis shows that it was ancient usage even in the time of Lehi.